So when we buy a property that's 70% occupied, I can bring in homes to add value to the property, thus increase, like forcing the appreciation up. That has nothing to do with the economy. The economy could be going doing good or bad. It doesn't matter. I have cash flow and I have equity growth. It's a cash growth fund. So. Welcome to the Multifamily and More Virtual Meetup. This is an interactive podcast with the goal of bringing you, my wonderful, wonderful members, access to high-level individuals in the space of real estate, mindset, or anything in between. Today's guest, Brandon Turner, is a really good one. Uh, and he is an investor, author, musician, father, and husband. If I didn't cover them all, let me know. He also happens to be the host of the largest uh, and baddest real estate podcast out there in the world, the Bigger Pockets podcast. There's three books, the book on rental property investing, the book on managing rental properties, and the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down have all been bestsellers and continue to do really, really well. Brandon has recently turned his attention to uh, mobile home parks and has traveled the country looking to grow his already growing portfolio. So Brandon, welcome. Dude, that was, that was an amazing intro. Thank you very much. I want to know that guy. He, he sounds great. <laughs> I'll, I'll email it to you. <laughs> you can have it. You can yeah, have this it. is awesome, dude. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, this will be fun. I'm, uh, I'm obsessed with talking about real estate and personal development and finance and everything else. So we can go anywhere you want today. I'll take it. I'll take it. So guys, for, for those joining, uh, the way this works, again, a podcast is a podcast. The goal of this is to be interactive. You know, a guy like Brandon and other guests that we've had on, uh, you know, this is a fairly intimate setting, something smaller than maybe Brandon's used to on his weekly webinar. So you have them, you have access to them ask questions. You can throw them in the chat box. You can throw it in the q and I'll grab them and throw them at Brandon as we go. Uh, and I have my list of questions here as well. So we'll get rolling if you're ready, sir. I am ready. And a big shout out to the people who have commented already. Grant, Albert, Melody, Paige, Travis. What's up, y'all? Chris. Uh, hello. Look at There's already questions rolling in here too. Well, yeah. I'll get to those. Yeah, but I'm going to <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna say hi to everyone. A good crew, man. It's a good Joel, crew. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, What's thank you, Joel. All right, so my first question really is, like everyone knows who you are, right? You know, you're, you're Brandon Turner, Bigger Pockets, Brandon Turner. You have uh, talked a lot about in your podcast, your investment portfolio, rental property. I think you had a multifamily at one point, 20, 25 units, something like that. But you've kind of moved over to mobile homes. So the question really to start this off is, why mobile home parks? You know, why'd you go to that asset class? And walk me through that transformation for you. Yeah, so why mobile home parks? The short answer is, because I chose them. And I say that uh, like for a reason, because like, I don't believe mobile home parks are the end all be all greatest investment of all time necessarily. I, mean, I, I really like them and I can explain why, but the more important reason is because I chose them. And so I, I realized for a long time, like I would give this advice to newbies who are just getting started with real estate. They're like, well, should I flip or should I do wholesaling or rentals or should I buy this or should I Airbnb? And for like newbies will go for months or years not taking action because they don't know what the right thing for them to do. And so lately I've been really, really uh, convicted on this idea of like, there is no one right thing. Just pick something that sounds great and go all in on it. So I picked mobile home parks, went all in on it. Now I didn't do it blindly. I, I, I like mobile home parks. I own one already. Uh, I bought one a year and a half ago and it's just been a phenomenal investment. I really like it a lot. It's just like a little ATM machine. And it's not been without work, like we've done work, but I set it up in a way that had other people involved with it. So my friend, Ryan Murdoch, who's partnered on it, uh, we raise money uh, through, uh, we, you know, all of us put money in, but I'm working with Mindy Jensen as well, the uh, host of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. And it just, it was a phenomenal investment. I really enjoy it. Uh, there's a few other like actual like tangible reasons why I like mobile home parks. One, uh, typically the most like variable expense when owning rental properties is repairs and maintenance. It can go in CapEx, like those can go crazy one year and it's really hard to, you know, evaluate how much it's going to be. With mobile home parks, the way that I buy them is, uh, the way that I'm buying them is the tenant owns their own home, which means I don't have to do all of that obnoxious uh, repairs and maintenance because it's their home. And so that's one thing that really struck me is like, I, I want to do this because of that. Uh, there's other things too. I mean, like I, I like to say that mobile home parks are the most res recession resistant investment out there because when rents drop, like what, you know, when the economy changes, which will probably change at some point, it's going to compress rents a little bit. I don't think it's going to, like, it doesn't usually drop them. If you look at historical, it compresses them, means that starts at the top. So the $5,000 a month rentals, the really nice ones, are going to go to the four, like those people are going to be wanting to reduce and tighten their budget so they go down to 4,000. The 4,000 are going to 3,000. The three are going to 
2,500, 2,500 going to, you know, 2,200 and it compresses, but the bottom where they're paying $200 in lot rent to live in a mobile home park, that's not moving. That typically doesn't move because those people are on already fixed incomes and uh, that just kind of stays there. So again, it's, it's recession resistant, uh, but also has a huge opportunity for growth as you add units, which we call infilling. So there's a few reasons why I like it a lot there. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons actually you just brought up. Yeah. So a couple I, mean, things, I, I, so- I go through like 10 more, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this question that popped up in the Q and A just says, uh, it says, so you just own the land. It's essentially, is that what it is? You own the land and the utilities that, that support that land. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah. I mean, in an ideal, okay. That's like an idealized property, right? Like I don't own any of the units. Uh, so we're under contract right now on eight mobile home parks. And so we, we started a fund and we have eight of them under contract, uh, like 500 ish units total. And uh, most of them are tenant owned, but in any situation, you're going to get a few stragglers that for whatever reason, they happen to be rentals uh, or maybe they are, uh, some of them are sold off with seller finance. So like I actually get the notes then. And so we're selling them, but yes, ideally I don't want to own any, homes at all. I only want to own the land. Uh, but again, there'll be a few stragglers. When you have 500, there's probably going to be, you know, a small percentage that are rentals, which we will then turn over right away into they own their own. All right, let's dig it. So eight mobile home parks, that sounds like yep. a lot. And, and I think about it in my world, the multifamily, like I, I you know, it's far, hard to find one in my market, let alone any other, unless you're, you know, you're just buying a class and, and, and looking to yeah. get out of the back end in seven years with uh, with upside how are you how are you finding first off what's your what's your lead generation look like to get that many mobile home parks under contract yeah good question uh so most important uh so most importantly what i do is i built a machine a marketing machine and let me explain what i mean by that because this is something that anybody can apply i teach this on webinars by the way don't mind the alarm clock birds chirping it's uh, you know <laughs> i'll have a dog hawaii. park at some point so okay good. no problem <laughs> yeah we have these birds in hawaii they just wake you up at like 6 a.m they just like tweet all morning. Anyway, so I teach this thing on webinars all the time where I say that every single deal comes down to, like every single investor comes down to the same four step process. I call it the lapse funnel. You got to get leads, you got to analyze them, you got to pursue some of them, and then sometimes they end up successful. So LAPS, leads, analysis, pursue, success. And so all I did is I just formalized that and, and said, okay, well, how do I get consistently a ton of leads coming in? How do I get a, a lot of them analyzed? to figure out exactly how much I can offer to pursue them for, knowing that eventually they'll trickle down. And so uh, I found some, I don't want to call them interns because they're really like more than interns. They're just like unpaid partners that get part of the deal if they bring me something. So I got, we, we started with 30 people, 15 that were just cold calling uh, anybody from uh, private sellers to um, mom and pop, you know, mom and pop sellers to brokers uh, to whoever they could possibly find. There's 15 people that started there. And then there was another 15 that were analyzing all the leads that were coming in and running the numbers and then just firing off offers. So we made a bunch of offers. We analyzed a ton of deals and we got a, a lot of leads coming in. Uh, but the deals we got, two of them, uh, one was just on, on it, two of the parks, I should say, out of it was one portfolio. So two parks were on market directly. Uh, another three were kind of on market. They hadn't quite blasted out to everybody in the world yet. And then another three were pocket listings. So the broker hadn't told anybody about it, but we happened to contact him on the right day and built a relationship with him over a few weeks. And then he got this, somebody he knew and somebody, one of our team members knew anyway. So a pocket listing, that's how we're getting them. Uh, but really it's just all about running that funnel and just like sifting through more and more and more of them until we got some, uh, Thanks. yeah. No, it makes sense. That's uh, so yeah, you're right. It's, I was actually a question I was going to ask, like what, what is similar in moving from rental property over to mobile home, like from you know, top to bottom, what's similar in terms of, uh, of uh, your funnel, in terms of acquisition, in terms of management, in terms of exit, and what's been like your big learnings, like, wow, this is really different. Even though it's within the real estate space, this is really different. So I'll ask that question, I guess. There are a couple things that jump out is like, the same skill set that you had owning a rental portfolio is the same, you know, you can apply in this. And is there one or two things like completely different uh, between trailer park and real estate? And then we'll get to some of these uh, questions that are popping up. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of it's pretty similar. There's not a lot that's completely unique other than the thing that's been most surprising is the lack of data, both from a like national standpoint, like there's nobody that just has a collection of all the mobile home parks and like, like it's, it's very disjointed across the country. So it's really hard to get data on mobile home parks. Uh, we build everything, like kind of got to build it from the ground up. Like, and then even more importantly, getting data, like simple things, like how much money do you charge for rent? 
like per unit. And like owners sometimes don't know that stuff. How many units do you have? They don't know that stuff sometimes. These mom and pop owners have been just running it off the, you know, the, the seat of their pants for like ever. And they don't have very good records. Like one of our deals, like literally the deals we're working through. Now, granted this one, uh, three of the parks, they're kind of the pocket listing. The guy just bought it a few months ago. He's an older gentleman who's just, uh, he bought it thinking he had time to work on it. Doesn't. So now he's just kind of sell them. And so we're buying a few of the big portfolio he bought recently. There's no financials at all. Like just nothing. And so what we're doing is basically he just, he just said, well, I'll sell them based on whatever we can all as a group agree on is going to, going to be the expenses. Cause he's like, I don't have the expenses. We just got to work that out. And then we'll just do a nine cap on whatever else, on whatever we determine as a group, the expenses are. So it's like a w really unique way of dealing with it. And so like analyzing, if I'm going to go analyze a, a you know, a, a fourplex, it takes me 15 minutes, right? 10 minutes, maybe five. If I'm using like, you know, a good like bigger pockets calculator or something like that, five or 10 minutes, you know, I might have to make a call maybe to the County assessor to find out, are taxes going to go up when I buy it or are they going to stay the same, right? Like sure. questions like that, but it's relatively easy. With a mobile home park, it takes like four, five, six hours to analyze a deal because like there's a hundred of those things that just, you don't know. Like they're just, because they're all in different counties, different areas. It's always, you don't get that like, oh, I just know how this works. Uh, furthermore, property management is a lot more difficult to find good property managers. I've heard there's not as many that want to handle, like the, there's not as many of these nationwide companies. So we're taking it in-house. And we're, uh, I brought in an asset manager who's uh, also owns a property management company and the, he owns some mobile home stuff already. So he's taking over that side of the business. Hmm. Uh, Brian Murray, actually a Go Abundance guy. Uh, so he's taking over oh, the entire okay. asset management. So yeah. Very cool. Very so, cool. Some, some differences there. There was a, there's a question that, that you made me think of just now when you said that, but let me get to a couple of the member questions sure. here. So uh, there's a question. Are you responsible for the infrastructure in the parks, roads, water lines, gas lines? Is that just a large CapEx budget? So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, that's exactly what we're responsible for all the infrastructure. So yeah, lights, um, roads, things like that. So with one of the parks, like most of the parks had pretty good roads that we're not going to replace them. One of them though, like the largest park, we were like, this is rough. So we, uh, we were negotiating with a seller and, and like it was, it was an expensive thing. So we're working it into the sales price. They came like, they're actually giving us a credit at closing so we can put new roads in. So that'll take care of that for the next 20 years uh, or so. But yeah, CapEx, we just, we typically, the number that I see tossed around a lot, and again, I haven't been in the industry long enough to have this number for myself. So the number that Frank Rolfe uses, that uh, Kevin Buff used, that Jefferson Lilly used, that some of the bigger guys that I know, uh, is $125 per uh, lot per year in, in CapEx for a budget. So that's the number that gets tossed around a lot. So that's the number we're using. Um, and again, that can go up and down depending on like, like this one part, we're putting brand new roads and that's the most expensive CapEx you're going to deal with. And it already has new plumbing. They've done that recently. So that was going to be probably significantly less CapEx because there's not a lot to really do. That makes, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's, it's so, it's just, as I analyze multi, multifamily deals, like a lot of the terminology, even the yeah. cost, some of the cost structure you're talking about is so similar. It's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very similar in a lot of ways. It's just a, a lot muddier, which I like because like in, and I mean, this is one of the reasons I chose mobile home parks is because like, Right now, there's a lot of people out there looking for apartment complexes. I mean, apartments are hot right now. And not that mobile home parks aren't. They are. But there's, it's so much harder to do a mobile home park. It is the hardest investment I've ever done ever in terms of like just trying to like figure it out. Um, it's not as well known. There's not as many people teaching it. There's not. So like that barrier to entry keeps a lot of people out. And so like because it's something that I had to like really work at getting good at, that's a competitive advantage above apartments is another reason I like it. It's because I can get good at it where 90% of the world will not get good at it because it's just, it's just irritating. It's, that's a good way to put it. It's irritating to deal with mobile home parks. And there's fewer and fewer of them now. Are there not? It's a diminishing, I don't want to say diminishing asset. What's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's just- I, I know you're saying, I think I heard that they're losing 1% per year. Like 1% of all the parks are getting completely re, like destroyed and rezoned every year and other stuff put in. So, you know, eventually there won't be any mobile home parks probably. But I like that too, because it means that like the fewer they are, like people, there's, an, there's a massive affordable housing problem in America today. And I've been like looking at a lot of stats lately. I read this great thing from Harvard that just showed like, like how many new builds are going on in, today, in the today's economy and like how all of them are at the high end of the market, almost entirely. That's true. Yet in the, the low income housing need is actually increasing. Like it's a problem that over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years in America, we're going to see more and more of an issue with. And so I like being in an asset 
that perfectly serves a problem that we're going to like a really big problem in America for the next 20 years we're going to have and an increasing problem. I like saying, Hey, I own an asset that's going to be solving that rather than the, you know, the asset at the high end of the market at, you know, the three, $4,000 a month rentals where it's the first to get hit in a recession. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people like Grant Cardone are in that and they're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars off that. Good for them. But I, I like being on this end. It's the saying, like he's got a plane, he's doing something right. So yeah, yeah I'm not going to fight him. Um, <laughs> exactly. And you're right on the multifamily side. That's why I like the C class, low B class assets. I was yeah. talking to Joel Florek, who was on this call yes. about that yesterday. It's the same thing. Cause you know, the same A thing. class stuff is going to, is going to fly away and uh, the C and B is not being built. So yep. um, exactly, exactly the same logic. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. So there's this other question. I'll, I'll ask a part of it cause you answered a good chunk of it, but it was uh, how many mobile homes per acre. Is that, a, I don't know if that's a stat that you have. Is that, like, yeah. do you have any, Per, that do you expect? Like how many mobile homes per acre do you expect? Or is there any kind of, like how that's many can you question. I don't know. I mean, that's a really good question. I don't know. Cause I never, I never even think, I have no idea how many acres I'm buying. Uh, I know it's a lot. Uh, so I can tell you like number wise, like most of the home, most of the parks you're buying um, are around a hundred units on average, uh, like ish, uh, maybe a little bit less. Uh, like one of the parks has 168 lots, 120 are filled. Uh, another one has 50 lots and 50 are filled. And that one's like a completely full one, but we're buying those two together. Uh, another one had like 30, one had 70, another one had 140, I think. So like they're kind of all over the place. And I'm trying to think if I, I think it was like 10 acres, if I had to remember right, or maybe it was 20 acres for the 168 lots. So whatever that works out to. Anyway, yeah, that's actually yeah, probably a stat I should look into because I don't, I don't even know acreage. I never think that way. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know if there's zoning on that even, right? Like you got yeah. have so many pads per acre. There, or whatever. there definitely is zoning on like, how, like you can't, you can't easily just add more lots if they're not already approved for it. It's sure. possible. But the, one of the things about mobile home parks is like governments don't like them. They really don't like them. Like, and they want to get rid of them over time, even though they, at one side they want to get rid of them because they cause a lot of like drama in their thing. And um, a point Frank Rolf makes is that mobile home parks are one of the largest usage of public schools resources because a lot of kids love mobile home parks, yet they bring in the least amount of income for those schools because the tax is so low on those mobile homes. So the government from a tax perspective doesn't like mobile home parks because they don't bring in any revenue. Uh, unlike yeah. they were to put it in something else. Sorry, I, was gonna, that's, uh, I wonder if that's, this is, I don't mean to generalize, but I wonder yeah. if that's true for all like government tax, like, like police, Probably, police yeah. departments, right? Like, you know, like yeah. do more police responses happen at a mobile home park potentially than at, at other yeah. parts of a town? You know, I, I don't know, maybe again, I don't know if, yeah, I'm, probably, if I just probably. got out of the PC realm there. But, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 probably. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure um, they get more than the A-class apartments. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Although I'm sure they have their stories we, there as well. We had, a, we had a bank robber in our mobile home park in Maine. Like he robbed a bank and then he's on the run from the feds right now. So like those, those things happen. Did he, wear, a, the, yeah. did he wear the black? Like the I black hope so. Thing? I don't know, but I, I hope he did. I hope he had like the Hamburglar outfit is, is my goal. But what a picture. We also had a... Uh, a woman of the night, we'll call her, who uh, who had an operation where she didn't actually deliver the goods. She uh, robbed people who came. And so we got like a, we had a woman who would solicit on Craigslist. They'd come to her trailer. She'd then rob them of their money. And so I don't know if you call her a thief or a hooker, but one of the two. And uh, yeah, you get, you get stories like that in a mobile home park. You just, you, you it's much more management intensive. Woman of the night. Isn't that what Whitney Houston was in The Bodyguard? <laughs> I don't know. Queen I don't know what's the PC way of saying she was a prostitute. I don't know, but no. Okay. We'll go there. Anyway. I like it. All right. There's a question from Kapil. I hope I'm saying that right. Kapil Mishra. Uh, sounds like uh, you chose to follow a fund model versus doing syndication. Is that correct? If so, why choose a fund versus syndicating? Yeah. Good, good question. Uh, I'm actually doing kind of like technically, legally, it is a fund but I'm treating it like a syndication that is buying eight parks. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm doing a, I don't, I don't know the terminology. It's probably like called like an open or closed fund, but I open, I'm opening the fund. We're going to buy these eight parks. Then I'm going to close the fund. And that's it. That's all we'll ever be in this fund. So I'm not having like a long-term fund. The reason I did that is because one, I didn't want to do fifth or I didn't want to do, you know, eight different syndications all with a 10 to $15,000 fee each one. Furthermore, I wanted to diversify within. So like, I mean, if one mobile home park had some problem, got hit with a tornado, let's say, or, you know, whatever, there's seven more or whatever number we end up buying. I mean, right now we're eight, like we might get another two, we might lose a couple in due diligence, who knows, but I wanted a, a number of them to diversify within that class that are all pretty similar. The numbers are all basically the same for all of them, but 
it just adds a lot of safety, I feel like, for investors and for myself. And that's why I chose that. But again, I don't want to go the individual syndication route because it's a lot of money to set up each one. And so okay. that's why I chose it. So it's a, it's a, it's a Cinda fund. We're going to make a new word today. It's a syndication fund. I don't know. You created Burr. So you, you can make Burr. Cinda fund. I did. Right. I actually did, did create another term actually in the marketing stuff for the fund. I call it a cash growth fund. And I say that like nobody has that term. So I like to invent terms, right? <laughs> Here's what a cash growth fund is. Is a, is a real estate investment or a fund that, that delivers cash flow from day one. So a lot of a lot of syndicators out there today are are pushing like you know these great maybe long term investments that like IRRs and you know fifteen percent let's say like but their cash flow in the first year two years three years is just crap or nothing maybe yeah. right so I've invested in syndications like multiple ones now and I've actually yet to receive a check from anybody at all because it's all like down the road it's going to be amazing right so I'm saying I want cash flow from quarter one you know like first quarter we got cash flow coming in. Furthermore, I want the opportunity to grow uh, from an equity standpoint that's non-market uh, dependent or non-economy dependent. So I want to make sure this produces cash flow in a good economy and a bad one, and that has a room for appreciation in a good and a bad one. And that's because the appreciation is not based on uh, the market. It's based entirely on the NOI and the, and the growth of the property. So when we buy a property that's 70% occupied, I can bring in homes to add value to the property, thus increase like forcing the appreciation up. That has nothing to do with the economy. The economy could be going doing good or bad. It doesn't matter. I have cash flow and I have equity growth. It's a cash growth fund. So I like it. heard it here first, folks. The new <laughs> phrase everyone's going to be using, cash growth. So there's this question here that I think plays into, and I, I might take it and then kind of maybe add on to it. That plays into what you just talked about, you know, and what, what you're doing with investors. The question's fairly lengthy, but it's from Joel. And it, what it boils down to is, you know, you've got this, this knowledge base now from all of the uh, interactions you've had. Um, what's your long-term vision? Is it, is it kind of like buy, sell three to seven year, or is it more of a long-term approach? And I guess the question along with that is what is the, and if you said it, I apologize, but what is the, uh, investors, what are you, what are you giving investors for, for investing in your fund? What does that look like? What's the exit look like if you can get into those details? Sure. Yeah. Uh, they get the privilege of working with me and that's it. So they don't get any money. They don't have to give me money. And in fact, I just keep it at the end of the project. That's just how it works. You are a uh, brand. Yes. I am a brand and you know that, uh, from like the detail standpoint, we're doing a 70, 30 syndication, split, like, you know, fund syndication, whatever we're doing a 70, 30 split with investors. Um, it's, uh, we're projecting 16% IRRs or greater. I like to be conservative. I'd rather under promise over deliver. Yeah. Uh, if the model which we're working toward works the way I think it's going to work, here's it. I can explain what that is. I haven't really actually shared it with anybody yet outside of my own circle, but what I'm really excited about is like this idea of in, So the problem with parks, so you asked that question earlier. I know I'm going all over here, but okay. when you asked that question earlier, what is different about a mobile home park versus other real estate? Here's an interesting thing. If you own an apartment complex that has 40 units and you've got a few units that are empty, let's just say, you can raise rent to increase the NOI, uh, thus making the value of the property higher. You can raise rent, you can lower expenses a little bit, and that's about it. You can't just go and add on, I mean, you can build, but that's a tremendous amount of work to go and build a new building to add units. With a mobile home park, I'm buying it, for example, I'm buying this one in Ohio, for example, that's, uh, that I was visiting when I met you. I'm buying it at basically the worth of where it's at right now, 125 or whatever it is units. But I can bring in homes that immediately adds lot rent. Now the problem for most people in the world, they're looking at this and they're saying, well, yeah, but then you got to pay for a home. You got to pay to move it in. You got to pay to get it hooked up to the sewer system and all that. You're going to be out, you know, minimum 15, $20,000. And I mean, you do that 10 times and that's a lot of money. You do that 20 times and that's really a lot of money, right? Well, what I'm going to be working towards, and we haven't perfectly nailed this down yet, but we've tested it a few times and it's working awesome, is working with people like from Bigger Pockets, for example, who are not accredited investors. So they can't be part of the fund, but they've got 15 grand. They would love to invest. So essentially what I'm going to be doing is finding these homes, moving them into the park, setting everything up, selling the note to get, so I get paid back entirely. It's almost like a burr inside of the mobile home park, right? So I bought a home, moved it on site, rehabbed it, got it all set up, found a tenant, moved the tenant in. And now I'm, now I'm into the whole deal. It's called for $20,000, the entire thing for 20K. I then sell that to a tenant, the home. I sell the tenant to the home for 20 grand. 
but the tenant is making payments on it. I then sell that note mm -hmm. to an investor. Like for example, you, let's say you pay $20,000. Now you get that, let's call it eight to 10% return somewhere in there. So you're maybe a newer investor, wants to get into it, wants a relatively easy way and you got 15 or 20 grand. It's not enough to really buy like a, a huge deal yourself, but it's enough to get in the game, right? Yeah. So the beauty of this model is this, the, the person like uh, who lives in the property now, they're paying 10% interest. They're over a five year span. Their money just goes directly from them to you. Let's say that's the, you're the investor, sure. right? So I have, I, and you bought the note for me, which means I have no money out of pocket at this point. Right. You get the money, the 10%, but what do I get? I get lot rent mm -hmm. of 250 bucks a month. And I can do that over and over and over and over and over. And essentially I can add NOI, like growth. Like I can increase my net operating income increase my revenue, increase my property value without spending a dime of my own money. Unlike apartment complexes, which require you to put in a big cash payment every time with the mobile home park thing. And I don't know anybody who's talk, who does this, but it's a phenomenal way to now get other people involved, get them into real estate, get them excited, get them working with my team and me to do these little homes. And maybe eventually I'll just find one you know, rich person who just can just do that and make the 10% every single time. Uh, and I don't work with a lot of people, but I like the idea of working with a lot of people and getting them their foot in the door because those people later, once they get comfortable, are going to be the ones that are going to be able to fund more of the fund. Uh, and it's a good entry point. So anyway, that was a very long answer to that. Uh, but uh, I'm, the more I put this together and I almost don't want to like say this to the world because like, I don't know anybody else has figured out that exact model, but if it works the way I think it's going to work, like every park that's half empty in the country becomes my oyster and yeah. I can buy any of them because you buy them for where they're at and you just bring in homes and you finance it with other people's money selling notes off. So anyway, that's big picture. That's almost as, as good as you can get as far as, you know, 360, everyone benefits. There's, yeah. there's, 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 you're literally draining, you're monetizing every aspect of the purchase, right? That's yeah. essentially what you're doing, which is pretty impressive. So no, that's, that is interesting. Hey, you heard it here. For, is that an exclusive? Did yeah. I get an exclusive? I've never, I've never actually told that whole plan to anybody other than my own team. So you got an exclusive right now on that. You guys, aren't you excited? This yeah. guy, this guy. So Thank yeah, I, the reason I got into that is because I was saying the IRR, we're projecting like 16% based on just adding a few of these units in there. Yeah. But like, if this works the way I think it will, I'm hoping we can get significantly higher. Um, but I don't want to promise that in case this doesn't work. You know, in theory, everything's always better than practice. And even though we've tested it now, we've sold off a few houses that way and it's been awesome. Yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're working towards. So no, anyway. but you're right. under promise over deliver, right? Cause you, yeah. it sounds like you feel very confident that you can get at least 16%, yeah. even if yes. you don't execute that strategy and it just exponentially yes. goes up if, uh, if you are able to execute it. So. Correct. Yes. And if we, if we are, it's going to be stupid. And uh, yeah. And so other than that 8% preferred ret return we're offering, like, so kind of the basic syndication stuff, 8% pref, uh, a uh, waterfall at over 15%, we start splitting at 50, 50 instead of 70, 30. Uh, that gives us the incentive to really like, Again, I want, I want to see 50% IRRs. Like that's what I want to see, right? And so like, I'm going to work my tail off like to build that machine. Uh, and so that's where we're headed. I like it. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, you were occurring to me that there's a couple of guys that I, I network with in, in, uh, in my pod and go abundance as you were talking about, <laughs> who um, are, are cash heavy and they're looking to be extremely passive just because yeah. of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're buying turnkey. They're buying 20, 30, $40,000 turnkey properties and getting yep. a 10% you know, ish return on that. Yeah. So you're essentially doing that with, I mean, I think an even better model because they just own the note. You don't own the property. And is this turnkey operator reputable? Yeah. Are they going to actually fill your unit? Is the yep. roof truly replaced or is it falling down? You're yeah. just, you own the note. You're just selling the note off. That's all you have to do is collect the, the you know, the note or foreclose yep. if they don't pay it. So I have a big problem with turnkey because like, I mean, the, the, the problem I have, I mean, I like the idea of turnkey yeah. a ton, right? But the problem I have with it is like these guys, I mean, I got friends that do it as well. They make good income. So they're like, what's the easy way? Let's, let's buy turnkey. So they buy it and then he's telling like one of my buddies like, yeah, I'm getting a 10% return. And I'm like, are, are you really though? Cause like when everything's working perfectly and you get all the rent and you had zero expenses that month, you are making a 10% return. Let's look over the next 10 years when you have to replace windows and flooring and appliances and siding and all that stuff, your 10% return looks like a 2% return or a 0% or a negative 10% return unless you were to analyze those deals right. So the way I always say with turnkey is like, they can be great, just don't let the turnkey company do your math. You do your math based on conservative estimates and right. plug in those things like vacancy, repairs, capex, maintenance, management, all that. Makes sense. And if it makes sense, then do it. Yep, that's, that's a great tip. That's, I, I'm leery of the same thing, so that's a great, great tip. 
Uh, there's a bunch of questions here. I'm going to see uh, management fee. Is there, what, what, how does management fees work? Yeah. I mean, like, like for example, our park in Maine right now, we just have a local property manager who just took it. Cause he's, um, he's like a legit, he's a friend of mine. He's a friend of Ryan Murdoch who I'm working with. Uh, Ryan used to work for the company. So they charge in like, like they charge like six to 10% depending on the size. So it's pretty similar to multifamily. Uh, the problem is most property managers are not equipped to handle mobile homes and mobile home parks. It's just a few nuances that they're not prepared for. Uh, so that's why we're taking it in-house. And so we're going to end up paying, I think we're paying 8% to our like in-house. Essentially we're taking 8% from uh, the uh, 8% from the company, like, you know, and giving that to the asset manager uh, and his property management company is going to run it for 8%. So anyway, pretty similar eight to 10% probably. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, there's a question about screening. Do you do any kind of screening for people moving into, or can you into the community? Yeah. I'm sure you can, but yeah, you definitely can. Uh, especially when you're selling off uh, a home, like we're going to treat it just like a tenant. Like we're going to do the three times monthly rent. You got to have a stable job. You got to have all that. So we'll do all of those things. Uh, now let's say somebody wants, yeah. And if somebody wants to move into the park, we'll do the same screening. You got to have an income, got to have a job. People don't typically move into parks though. It's not that common. Sure. Uh, despite people, the word mobile home, mobile homes are not actually that mobile. They're very expensive <laughs> to move. And the average person isn't going to spend seven grand to move their home from one park to another. It's just cost prohibitive. So, uh, the biggest, the biggest problem with lack of screening comes from, let's say like I rent, let's say I rent a, a unit to you uh, or I sold a unit. Let's say you own one, right? So mm -hmm. you own a home there, but you're a landlord. You're not actually, so then you go and put in your own tenant there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're almost like arbitraging it, right? Like, so you pay me for lot rent 250 bucks a month, but it's your home and you're now renting it to a tenant. I have no say really on that tenant because that's your, like I'm renting to you. So I, I honestly don't have a great answer yet for how we're going to deal with that. Um, part of it is like, Hey, if they don't pay rent, it's still on you. Cause I'm renting to you. Right. Uh, Cause you're the landlord. Um, I can, I mean, I could, I could refuse to work with people who do arbitrage, which there are some that do that. But that kind of hurts me as well. So I think a lot of it is just vetting your arbitrage people like you to make sure that you're actually a legit person that if something goes wrong, you yeah. can handle it. So. I don't know why that never occurred to me that that happens. I don't know why. Yeah. I never, it could never occur to me that people would buy up pads and put, put yeah. homes on, or rent out pads, put homes on them and then charge, yeah. charge rent. You know, There's actually great money in that. There's a guy named, uh, oh, I'm going to forget his name now. Anyway, years and years ago, I mean, like the, the Lonnie Deals. It was like, they're called the Lonnie Deals. Basically what you do this is a great tactic for new investors. You go out there and you find a mobile home in a park that's already there and you use direct mail marketing or driving for dollars, or whatever. And you get this park under contract, but let's call it a thousand dollars. That's actually not unreasonable. You can buy a home for a thousand bucks if it's an older home. You buy that home and maybe you go in there and fix it up a little bit. Maybe you put two grand in to make it a little nicer. Now you've got 3000 of your own hard earned money into this, into this deal. You then rent that out or sell it off as a, a seller finance deal to somebody. They go and bring a, they, the person who's, you know, moving in, they put a $3,000 down payment down. Well, now you got all your money back sure. and now they're paying $500 a month to you for a payment on that for the next five years. So you have no money in the deal, or maybe let's say they put a thousand dollars down. You got a couple grand down and you're making a 80% cash and cash return on your money. So that's a, uh, a really interesting way to get started with real estate. Actually, if you don't have a lot of cash is just do like the arbitrage thing inside of a mobile home park. That's interesting. Actually, I think you answered the, the last question that just popped in for a new investor wanting to get into the mobile home business. What advice? That's that's getting yeah. into the home business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Stuff, but yeah. Really other than that, the other advice is just like literally, like just like run, like get really good at the math. Like good math overcomes a lot of fear, overcomes a lot of problems. It's like the better you are with math and understanding how it works, uh, the better. And there's not a, I mean, there's enough research. Like there's some good podcasts out there. Kevin Bupp has one. Jefferson Lillet has one that you can learn a lot about how to do it. Just educate yourself because it's it's a whole new thing. No, absolutely. So we got this question. Uh, you may have touched on this, but from a, from a bank stamp, this is from Zachary in the Q&A. What are the major differences you found how banks underwrite uh, or financing terms for mobile home parks versus multifamily? Is there, I don't know, can you speak to that at all, what banks look at? Sure. Actually, that's the biggest problem we're having right now is uh, that we're working through is like a lot of banks don't want to uh, lend. The bigger banks um, don't want to lend on properties that are smallish. And so some of our parks that we're buying are like 50, 60 units. Uh, and we're buying them in a portfolio, which is why I did it. Cause I'm like, Oh, three, you know, three fifty units in one area is like 150. But the, the banks aren't looking at it like that. They're like, Oh, we don't deal with parks that are under, you know, hundred units or whatever. The smaller community banks, they will deal with the deal with those. The problem with that is they want local investors only. They don't want to deal with out of state investors. So we're like, we're in talks with, I think 30 banks right now, like just going back and forth, like 30 banks, like this is Ryan Murdoch. I was full-time thing is just dealing with loans. So, um, 
once you get into the larger unit, like the one that we're buying in Ohio, yeah, we got a, we got a four and a half percent interest rate, thirty year uh, non recourse loan, uh, like pretty like really good good terms uh, yeah. for the most part. Um, so that's been what that's taught us is that we don't want to stay in the 50, 60 range because the biggest headache we're having is going to be lending. Okay, well, let's get to the area. Let's get to the part of the market where we're no longer dealing with a problem. Like we don't have a problem with that, which means everything we buy from here on out will be a hundred units or greater because it's just so much easier to deal with lending. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I can imagine. Yeah. That's again, funny. Uh, I guess it's more like the million plus in the multifamily. Right? I'm just, I keep doing this comparison, yeah. but that's yeah. what I go to. Like, yeah. you know, it's, actually better to buy a $1.3 million property and get the kind of like really good financing. Yep. $950,000 property, which is less, but you're, you're limited on, you know, you're more limited yep. on maybe a 20 or 25 year amortization, depending on what you can get. Unless of course you're Brandon Turner and you can say, I'm Brandon Turner. Give me 30 years on this. Mobile yeah. Home. Yeah. That's how you got to do. Yeah. Surprisingly banks don't respond that well to me. Uh, you know, I'll give you a shout out on the podcast. They're like It's got to make sense. But um, <laughs> interesting thing on financing that I don't know, I don't know real in depth on this stuff. But I just heard it recently from Frank Rolfe, who's one of the largest mobile home park operators. He was saying that a few years ago, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got sued because they weren't providing loans on low income mobile home parks. And this. Loans, right. So yeah. they are being required to do loans like, like actual, like, you know, in, like good quality, low interest, like the kind of loans that we love to get on apartment complex. The same thing. They're requiring them to do that but they still have their minimums and it's like one or $3 million. So like we got to get over that $3 million mark to get into the Fannie and it's gotta be a little bit nicer park. It can't be all like junky and old, but if you get to that, then you get into Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac money, which is super cheap and really long-term non-recourse, all the great things. So again, further reason why it's good to go big. I did hear that. I was just talking to somebody in the group yesterday. So I'm, I'm uh, two nights from now I'm in Boston, Thursday night in Boston. And I, I created a meetup there to go to It's 50, nice. 60 people. This guy named Charles Dobbins, big multi multifamily guy is going to be there and a bunch of other uh, investors. And, and uh, it's being sponsored by a couple of capital firms that do Fannie Mae lending. And they were inviting a Freddie Mac lender there to, as she put it, like uh, improve the reputation of the Freddie product. And I, I, I that was interesting. And she kind of got into a little bit of, of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of, uh, kind of neat to listen to that there's uh i did hear about the low income lawsuit and everything i wonder if it has something to do with that but who knows yeah. but yeah uh, i was going to ask about non-recourse and it sounds like that is available in the in the mobile home it is available though we may not go for it we may actually just do a recourse debt because we can get a little bit cheaper yeah. and like i'm i'm so not concerned about these properties because they're so stable that's why i like mobile home parks that i may actually take the lower like lower rates if we can get them for a recourse debt versus a non-recourse if that makes That's sense. I, I haven't fully decided on that yet, but we're looking into it. And like the smaller parks, like they're, they don't want to deal, like it's all recourse at the smaller level with like local community banks. It's when you get up to the, the like the nicer parks, then it's all non-recourse. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in, I'm going to do one more question from the group and then I'm going to bring on uh, Matt Sieber, AKA Hooligan Six. I love this guy. Right. Uh, he actually just closed or is about to close under contract, excuse me, on a 55 unit mobile home in New York, uh, nice. owner, owner finance, actually a really interesting story. Um, but he's got a couple questions he'd like to throw at you as the, as the resident expert that you are. Um, <laughs> <That's not awesome. laughs> but, uh, I'll throw in, I'll throw in, there's a question from Madam who wanted to get a little deeper on your lead generation. Like how do you split, how do you do a split for those making cold, cold calls? And he also asks about eviction, but let's stick with that. Let's talk about the doing a split for those making cold calls for right now. What does that look like? So let me tell you what I did last time. And then that will likely change in the future uh, because I realized early on, I gave away way too much equity. And here's what I mean by that. So what we had offered people is if you, if you find the deal, you do a cold call and you bring, you bring the deal as part of our team. We had like 15 people doing this. Uh, we'll give you 5% of the general partnership. And then if you were the one that analyzed the deal, you get another 5% of the general partnership. If, so really I was giving away 10% of the GP to do that. I've realized that that's probably ex, like excessive. Uh, when I looked at what other people are doing, like, uh, just to bring the lead, like for a typical apartment complex, like, I mean, like if you bring the lead and you do all due diligence and you deal with all the drama and package up nicely, a lot of guys aren't given more than five or 10%. So we may shave down that slightly. Um, but typically right now it's about 5%. If you bring the deal and help us work through due diligence, we're giving about 5% of the general partnership for that. Okay. And, and the second part of this question, if you don't mind real quick, we'll touch it before we bring Matt on, which is, uh, evicting somebody with no money. Is it, is it, that it'll cost you, you mentioned about $7,000 to move a, move a mobile home. Is that going to, is that your cost if you're evicting somebody or what is that? Or do you, what does that look like? 
No, because here's, here's how it works. And I don't want to sound like flippant about this because it's a very sad thing if you have to evict a tenant. But if you evict a tenant and they don't pay rent and they have their home there, they have to move their own home. And they won't. They can't, right? So what do they do? They leave it there. And then you get to take possession of it. And there's a, there's a legal process for doing that. And every state's a little different. But essentially, in almost every case, that home becomes mine. Uh, and so like, even if it was their own home, typically what happens and what we'll, we'll probably do, and I can say this here because I'm sure my tenants aren't going to be listening, is we'll just offer them cash for keys. We'll buy their home from them for a price that makes sense to us. And, cause, and again, I don't want to sound flippant, like, but the sad thing is they don't really have any other options. Right. Like, they just can't move their home. They don't have seven grand. And so they will just get nothing. So if I offer them two grand for their home, uh, that's better than getting zero. And right. so most of the time in that situation, I get, I acquire a home then for two grand, which then let's say it's trashed. I then have to spend 10 grand fixing it up. Now I'm at 12 grand total, let's just say. And I then find a person who wants to invest their $12,000 into a deal. And I, I do the same model I talked about earlier, where I find a private lender to buy the note from me. So I'm not out anything. So even rehabbing homes, if I do an eviction, like all those costs get wrapped in the fact that I can sell that note off to a, uh, a you know, a new investor or somebody who's interested in just making a good solid 8% return for a while. Uh, potentially, and I'm still working through the legalities of this, but I might be able to even guarantee that. Like, hey, like you'll get your 8% and if something goes wrong, I'll buy the note back from you. That way you're guaranteed not to lose money. You're going to make your 8%. Now, again, there's there's some weirdness with like guarantees and tax stuff, so I need to work through that. But anyway. That's true. That's true. But, no, that's a good I, point. but I think that'd be cool. Is if, I get, if I could offer somebody, hey, you're going to make 8% and I guarantee that if anything goes, anything goes wrong, we'll buy the park back, we'll buy the home back, make it right and resell it to somebody else. So you're not out. I think that would be a really phenomenal, uh, I guess, sales pitch to get people to get that 8% return. Yeah, and again, I'll, yeah, I might find just one person who just does that all day long because 8% is a great return for somebody. So yeah, wow. who knows? always churning, man. Always churning. It's interesting. I'm trying to think of this stuff. <laughs> all right, let's bring Matt on. Matt, I hope you're ready. I hope you've been listening because you're about to be uh, front and center for all of us here. I'm going <laughs> to promote him to a panelist. Yeah. Just up. Oh, here he comes. There right, he is. There he is. Unmute yourself, Matt. I see you're on mute right now. Gotcha. Yeah, I just pulled over because I heard uh, I heard my name get called. Nice. Hi, Matt. What's up, dude? Hey, how are you? Good to talk to you. Good to meet you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, too. Man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. So go uh, for it, Matt. What's your question or questions? We'll get one or two in. All right. So, you know, I have heard that strategy um, before for bringing in the tenants where you bring in the park, find an investor, you know, give someone the opportunity to be the landlord, mm, um, yep. you know, make money. My question is, uh, what what other strategies do you have for bringing in park home homes? As far not park owned homes, but bringing in new, um, sure. yeah, yeah. So the short answer is, we're going to hire someone who does nothing but that. What I'm going to probably do is find a wholesaler in those markets and train a local wholesaler how to do it with mobile homes. So somebody who wants to get into real estate that wants to work with me, and my team wants to learn the business. It's like here's what here's what we want you to do. And, and the, the strategies we're going to use is one, direct mail marketing. I think direct mail to buy mobile homes is a phenomenal strategy because you have their, act, like find any local, um, any local mobile home park within a hundred miles, right? There's probably 50,000 pads within a hundred miles of all these parks, right? You hit them with a direct mail marketing campaign uh, to buy their home, not to the park owner, but the actual like mobile home owners. So you pretty much just like uh, US Postal Service, every door direct mail marketing for dirt cheap, hit all of them with, hey, we want to buy your mobile home. And so then it comes down to the same lapse funnel, get leads, analyze them, pursue them, get success. So we'll run a lot through direct mail, through door knocking potentially. I mean, you can go to another mobile home park, just knock on all the doors, say, hey, you know, we're looking to buy a home uh, because we've got a park that we're trying to, you know, put some units in, any chance you want to sell. So that's part of it. It's really no different than what a typical wholesaler does or a house flipper does to get leads. We're just doing it with mobile homes instead. Uh, we also maybe will uh, work with building like a team out of people who can do that maybe through bigger pockets. So, you know, put some on the marketplace and say, Hey, you want to, you know, make a few thousand bucks. We'll give you a referral fee for bringing in these homes. Uh, we got a guy named Tristan. He's a rock star out in Maine. This is where a lot of this came from. Tristan is a local mobile home investor. So he was doing that deal thing I mentioned earlier, the Lonnie's deals where he would find homes, the arbitrage thing, he'd find homes, he'd move them potentially, or they were already in the park and then he would rent them out and he's making good money doing that but he was getting really good at finding these homes. So we just said, hey, Tristan, can we just pay you, I think it was like a thousand bucks to find us homes? He's like, yeah, sure, no problem. So he just goes out and finds homes for us. Now we filled our entire park in Maine almost entirely up now just off of him. So I just need another, you know, a couple of him. So that's what we're doing. 
have you uh, have you had any success going to like mo uh, local manufactured home um, you know dealerships and then posting flyers or telling the salesman you know pretty much like your car salesman being like hey if, if this person's looking for a park if you recommend my park they move into my park because now i know most of these sales for new homes they are yeah. um you know that move-in cost you know is all factored yeah. into their mortgage and note have you had success doing that you know, um, a referral fee I have not done any of that yet. Um, I like the idea of all that, which is why the, when you asked me the question a minute ago, the first thing I said was I'm going to hire someone to do this. Cause yeah. like, I, I want to find somebody who's like a rock star that does not like their, their job essentially. And it might be a job might be W I mean, 1099 or whatever, or, you know, commission based, but like their job is to figure out all of that stuff because I personally haven't done it. Uh, and so the plan is, yes, I want them to do that kind of stuff. Uh, and whatever it takes to get these homes, uh, whether they're new, whether they're used, like that's going to be largely put on them. And I just have to manage that process. I'm not sure if that answers that, but yeah, that's the, that's the plan. Sure. Um, Jamie, am I allowed to ask another one? Yeah, go for it, man. We'll do one more and then we'll <laughs> move on to Mel Melody. Go for it. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. No, I, uh, I actually just had a question about, um, with, oh boy, I had it and I lost it. Oh, with, um, Submetering your water. Have you gone through any uh, companies specifically um, that have good programs for installation and remote metering? Yeah, so we're using, I think it's called Metron meters. Almost every single park uses the same meters. It's called Metron, a company called Metron. They okay. don't do the back billing or anything. That, that's our, our responsibility. So we're going to be doing the billing and all that. I know there are companies out there that will submeter and then build a tenant and deal with all the drama of it. And I like that idea. Uh, but we haven't experimented with it yet. We haven't touched it. So what we've done so far is we just added like for the park in Maine, we just added the Metron meters. Uh, it was kind of like in the process of as we were buying it, the, the owner was just finishing installing them. So then we just, the property manager just has a spot in their software. They're using rent manager, I think for the software. And it just says like, you know, extra line, it's back, you know, utilities. And they just bill them out every single month. And that's how we're going to operate the next eight parks as well. Most of them are already sub -meter. I think there's one or two that we're going to have to implement that and add the meters. Most of them have already recently been done. Okay. All right. So. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate the questions, man. The, good for you to meet Brandon and good luck on this uh, 55 unit uh, or 55, I can't keep going, unit, 55 pad <laughs> property. Uh, I actually just interviewed Matt for all those uh, out there. Oh, awesome. I'll post I'll post a video of him uh, talking about that deal in more detail uh, probably early next week as we get it edited. But, um, but yeah, good stuff. Yeah, thank cool. you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. All righty. All right, man. We'll see you. I'm going to demote right. you here. I got to figure out how to do this. <laughs> later. There you go. See you later. <laughs> All right. Hey, before I bring Melody in, and Melody, be ready. I'm going to pull you on here in a second. Um, I did want to ask, and there was a question about this from Elbert, and you started to touch on it a bit, but uh, value add, are there like a, a quick, like top three, four things that you look at as value add options within a mobile home park or what are like the, the big two or three, maybe think something people don't think about. Say, can you say that again? I lost you there for a second. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. So value add, uh, uh, what are the top two, three things uh, from a value add perspective that you look at when you go, is it just pad rents or is there? Yeah. What is good it? Yeah. It's, it's uh, the utilities, like the submit and the utility thing. That's huge. Like if I can, if I can find a property that's not submeter and I can submeter it, that instantly adds a ton of value. Yeah. Right. Lot rent being low. Uh, I'm not a very aggressive rent raiser. Uh, some people are really good at that. I'm just never been like, I don't buy, I'm not going to buy a park at $200 lot rent and jack it up to 350 just because I can. Um, at least I don't like, unless it's like everything around the area, it was a lot more. I just don't want to end up on the, you know, front cover of the New York times, like some mobile home park operators have been not only really front cover, but you know, like it's, it's dangerous to play at that level, like to, to just completely jack somebody's rent percentage wise in a, in a world where we're dealing with low income housing because it just doesn't look good. No, just looks like so yeah. Um, so value add, the most important thing is, is I want, I want parks that are partially empty. Like I want, like one of the parks we're buying is like 75% empty. Now the only, I'm, I don't want it usually that bad, but we're buying one like next door. That's much more largely filled, filled, which is kind of averages out good. But, uh, yeah, the, the key there is I want parks that are empty. I want parks that I can sub meter if it's not already being done. Uh, garbage I'm finding like nobody's submitting garbage. Like most of the parks, like I'm going to shift the garbage responsibility on the tenant for the most, like that'll save, you know, thousands of dollars um, a year just on that. Sure. Uh, and again, tenants aren't typically going to move over a, you know, oh, a $15 because now they got to pay their own garbage. That's your garbage, not my garbage, you know? So like, uh, that's one of the kind of value add things. Um, I try not to buy park. I don't want to buy parks that have like a lot of really old crappy homes. Like a lot of them, like if they're all fifties and sixties homes, like, 
they're hard to fix up and they're really small and people don't want to rent them and they don't want to buy them. Uh, and then there's a vibe, like we were touring a park in, in Illinois a few weeks ago and like you just, we drove with them park. It's hard to even say what it is, but there's a vibe you get that's scary. And you're just like, I don't, I don't want to own this. Like I, it's like a gut thing, but you're just like, this is, this freaks me out. I don't want to be here. Like, and so we left, like, we're just like, we're not going to buy that. Uh, it doesn't matter what the numbers look like in that. I just like, I just, I don't feel right here. There's something scary about this. I'm going to get shot if I'm here. So <laughs> we're avoiding the, I'm going to get shot parks. Smart D class. Yes. Yeah. I want to avoid the D. I got you. All right. So Melody made a, just sent a note to us that her mic might be having issues, but you know what, Melody, we're going to give this a shot. Uh, and if not, I can be chatty enough to, uh, to get, I can read lips. I read lips. read lips. <laughs> Throw the question in the, in the, in the message. The idea is to get face to face with the one and only Beardy Brandon here. So let me promote you. One and only. Panelist. Well, it is one and only. You've got the handle, right? I do. I do. I got the handle. <laughs> Beardy Brandon. Here she comes, Melody. There you go. Can you, do you know how to unmute Melody uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner? Oh. Just... No. Is that working? Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. I read the instructions. You hold your uh, space bar down. There you go. Ah, nice. I didn't know that. Pleasure to meet you, Brandon. Pleasure to meet you too. Nice to, uh, you know, uh, nice to see you. Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here to help if I can or, you yeah. know, whatever I can do. Uh, I don't have a question in regards to uh, trailer parks, uh, but I wondered if you've ever invested hmm. in any tax deeds. Oh, I have not. Uh, I've interviewed a few people on the podcast who have done it, and it seems like a phenomenal tactic or strategy, but I've done absolutely zero with it. So uh, other than like, it's one of those things that like, you can find a millionaire in every single niche of real estate. So if you're into tax deeds, I mean, you just go all in. You're like, yeah, that's your, that's your thing. You're the tax deed lady and you're just like crushing it. And that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, there's a guy, real quick, I'll just put this because tax deeds are big in Detroit. And I know, Melody, you're looking okay. up in your neck of the woods, but, um, and I'm, I'm local to Detroit now having moved here, but the, um, uh, in the YouTube channel, there's a guy named Marcos Jacker. who's actually our very first version of this uh, virtual meetup who oh, nice. and talked about tax deeds. So the video is on there for anybody interested, but it is, kind of a guaranteed way to get 24% returns, yeah. uh, little money into it. Now you gotta be mindful of what you're buying and he talks about that, but it's coming up. The tax deed is at the end of this month, I think in Detroit. And he actually, Marcos hosts a course uh, where he takes you right through the buying process. So if anyone's interested in that, let me know and I can hook you up. So shameless plug for the YouTube channel. Nice. <laughs> Melody, what else you got? Uh, I got a couple more questions. I'll try to be quick <laughs> though. Um, Brandon, on yes. one of your Bigger Pockets podcasts, you recommended an app called personal capital. I want you to know that that uh, was so appreciated by me. I immediately downloaded it and it has been amazing. I oh, can't believe how much closer we are than we thought we were just from being able to see in one app how everything is. Yeah. That being said, I want to know and I hope uh, you'll share with what kind of apps you're using right now what are you using them for what are your favorite apps um you know what ones do you recommend sure let me let me pull up my phone i'll show you a couple of cool <laughs> things so one that i've been using lately uh is the um deal machine app you guys ever use deal machine never heard of that no, no. So, so they there's a couple apps that are very similar there's one called deal machine one called driving for dollars what it does is it allows you to drive around, you see a little map. Uh, it's kind of hard to read on my mm -hmm. screen, but you get a little map, you drive around. And when you see a house that is maybe vacant or you want to, you know, whatever, all you do is click on the map where it's at and it says, okay, property address found. And then it searches the property records and it tells you, oh, this property is owned by the Lewis Greenwood Trust. Oh, great. And then I click one button and I will send them a mailer. I will send them a direct mail marketing mm -hmm. right from the app. Uh, and I can predefine what that looks like and all that. Um, but yeah, I've just added them to my list. I can even go in here and see things like what's their phone number. If they, you know, could they look up the phone number? Um, could you look up their email address? Sometimes that public data they can tap into, but again, there's two apps that do that. So I really like that one a lot. Uh, it's, and I don't do a ton of driving for dollars cause I live in Maui and, uh, I haven't like fully turned on my flipping machine here yet, which we're going to get into. Uh, so anyway, so that one's a big one. Uh, I do a lot of YouTube kids <laughs> cause I have a three-year-old. <laughs> So we do that a lot. Um, uh, from a, yeah, tons of like uh, that kind of stuff. What else do I use a lot? Um, I, I do, from a real estate standpoint, I use Evernote all the time. I'm an Evernote fiend. 
Um, I ever know it's for those who aren't aware, it's a way to, a way to like, just keep notes of anything you want. Then pictures you can put in there, audio clips, text, whatever. And then it syncs on all your devices. So it just makes it really easy on my computer. I'm like typing something. For example, this morning I was trying to figure out my password to get in my U S bank account. And like, I changed my password recently. So I go to Evernote and I'm like, I think I probably made an Evernote for that. Sure enough, there it was. And like, you know, I use that uh, for passwords. I use a thing called LastPass. So I keep track of all my passwords with LastPass. Um, I use something for Instagram stuff called Fonto, P-H-O-N-T-O. That's how I make most of my Instagram posts, uh, P-H-O-N-T-O. I really like that a lot. Um, there's probably more than that. <laughs> Gmail, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right. So, hey, we only had a couple minutes, Melody. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, have sure. to end it there for this, but thank you for, for jumping on and uh, say yeah. goodbye to, say goodbye. Yeah. Say thank goodbye. you, Melody. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to be in your neck of the woods. Uh, nice. My husband and I are taking our very first ever vacation. We're going to be That's in Oahu. Awesome. Uh, I'm actually meeting some people from bigger pockets out there. You should That's drop awesome. in. I, I love Oahu. Yeah. Let me know when you're going. I, I get over there once in a while, probably, once a month, we we'll probably jump over there. It's great. So if it works out, I would love to. Beautiful. Thank you. Melody. I appreciate uh, your time. Yeah, thanks, thank Melody. you. And thank thanks, you for Jamie. all the support too. Yep, absolutely. All right, Brandon, we got a couple minutes left. First thing I want to ask is cool. uh, where can people where can people find you, reach out to you? I'm like, a, I'm like a 13-year-old girl on my Instagram. I, Instagram's my, uh, my thing. Besides bigger pockets, of course. But yeah, Instagram's where I spend the bulk of my social presence. So at Beardy Brandon. Beardy Brandon. I really appreciate you coming on, man. For those that, uh, you know, I met Brandon at an event he just sort of randomly put up in, uh, in Detroit. Um, and I had all of you in mind as I awkwardly say like, Hey man, you want to, you want to do this, wanna do this little thing? I do? <laughs> Whatever. He's like, yeah, I don't know. Talk to, talk to my guy over here. Like, right, yeah. Cool. Ryan handles my whole life. It's just like, That's yeah, talk right. to Ryan. Figure it out. That's right. No, but I appreciate you doing it. Cause I know you got a lot going on and I appreciate that. Yeah. I think your, your wife is pregnant with your second child now. She is. Yeah. Yeah. It's she not is. to get real man. Four and one yeah, year old is. at home. It's crazy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so you know lots going on but i'm going to give you an option here to end this all right thing. So okay I, I was i was just doing my little my bit of research on you okay uh, and found a video that i don't know how well publicized it is maybe it's more than i realized of you Super. and your wife doing a rap battle of <laughs> ice, ice baby. So, so listen i have the karaoke version up and ready i could play it or the other option if you'd prefer not to i completely understand is to answer your fourth of the famous four questions uh, for the group. So I'll give you the option on either or, and we'll roll with it. Man, all I can tell you, I, I, how about this? Because if you played a song there, and then I tried to say it, the delay would make it really, really awkward for everybody. But I can tell you, it's stop, collaborate, and listen. Ice is back with a brand new invention. Something got to hold me tightly. Flows like a harpoon, daily, nightly. Will it up, stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn off lights, and I'll go to the extreme like a Michael Vandal. Light up the stage, watch it up like a candle. Dance. And it goes on from there. So yes, I do know all the words to Ice Ice Baby. Is that, uh, but the, yeah. is that in front of the mirror every day? Like, how do you, how do you keep day. up with that? Every day I look at myself in the mirror and I say it to myself 20 times. It's, it's my like, more, yeah, it's my affirmation. It's uh, ice ice baby. And the answer to the fourth question, the famous four, it's what separates successful people. Yeah. Um, man, I think it's consistent daily action. That's a phrase I love. Consistent daily action. It's gotta be the right action, but it's like, how long does it take to read a book? It takes, you know, a month to read a book? No, no, it doesn't. It takes like four hours, but we space it out so much because you, you know, so how long does it take to buy a real estate deal? Does it take six months? No, it takes like six hours. Yeah, we true. space it out though over the course of six months or six years, some people, right? So take daily action every single day and it's amazing how much you can accomplish. Excellent. Great advice. Great stuff. Guys, thank you all for joining today, Brandon. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, I really thank do appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, yeah this was fun. Yeah, Appreciate this was it. great. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Everybody have a great day. Brandon, thank you again. And uh, I'll see you all inside of the groups. We'll see you guys. Awesome. Aloha. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon.